My name is Mary Conquest. I'm your host for Safety Labs by Slice, the podcast where we explore the human side of safety to support safety professionals. We move past regulations and reportables to talk about the core skills of safety leadership, empathy, influence, trust, rapport, In other words, the soft skills that help you do the hard stuff. Hi there. Welcome to Safety Labs by Slice. Safety committees. I'm willing to bet that the term itself brings up a lot of associations for you, dear listener, and not all of them may be positive. Today's guest has explored safety committees in depth their purpose, their pitfalls, and how to help them succeed. Dave Rebbit is a military veteran who advocates for what he terms intelligent safety. He has over 30 years of management experience and is a prolific Canadian safety author, having published blog posts and peer-reviewed articles. He's the author of the books Effective Safety Committees and Harassment and Workplace Violence Investigations. Dave developed and taught courses for the University of Alberta's OHS certificate program. He served on multiple safety boards, including the Workers' Compensation Board of Alberta and the Board of Canadian Registered Safety Professionals. In his spare time, Dave enjoys writing science fiction novels. He joins us from Calgary, Alberta. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here. Look forward to an engaging discussion. All right. I'll I'll try I'll try my best. <laughs> um before we get into safety committees, as I was looking at your bio, I got really curious about the term intelligence safety. So what does that mean to you and why is it an important concept in your work? Well, intelligence safety is a term I came up with, I think, about 10 years ago. And uh, I really do mean to write a book about this. But, you know, there are so many different things out there these days. Safety one, safety two, hop, HR row. Uh, but, you know, they, they seem to think they've discovered that safety is about people. Uh, it always has been, and I think it always will be. It'll be about the human interface in the workplace. And, you know, if we reel back the clock, we, we think about, well, you know, management systems were a big thing a few years back, well, a few decades back. And uh, everybody's casting about for, you know, the silver bullet. And there really isn't one. Uh, so what I call intelligent safety is, you know, the concept simply put is you design the safety system as a health and safety professional where you're involved in implementing a health and safety system. And yet, you know, the questions we ask are are, are not really the right ones. And I, and I think the question we need to ask is, is it working? Uh, we often do audits or we do investigations to say, well, this bit's not working or that bit's not working, working. But we don't have a way to detect what Rasmussen called drift. You know, when you train somebody to do a task, at that moment in time, when you say, yes, you're competent, that's how you do the task, you're at 100%. But over time, people look for shortcuts, better ways to do things. And so they drift away from what we would expect. And eventually that results or can result in an incident. But, you know, organizations have no way to detect that drift. When I was working in uh, construction, I I did an experiment and uh, I found out something very shocking. If you take the high risk tasks that people do and you look into that, and, and I don't mean, you know, walk around, but really look into it, say, here's our procedure. This is what we expect you to do. Is the training being effective? Are people doing those things in that manner? Are we doing those things safely? Because those are two different measures. And what I found consistently was that people were performing high-risk tasks safely 75% of the time. Now, that would frighten most people, and, and it was of deep concern to me. But I found that across organizations, that tended to be about the number. 70 or 75% of the time, high-risk tasks were being done safely. And the the number of uh, times they were being done in accordance with procedures was somewhat less. You know, the question that we need to ask is, is the system that was designed and we're trying to implement, is it working? Is it being effective? And the answer to that is often not really. So intelligence safety is really about, you know, not just writing a manual or training people on it, But having health and safety people, instead of running around doing inspections or observations, actually digging in and saying, is this working? Are we effectively managing the risk here? 
And the answer to that is no, about 25% of the time. And of course, on low-risk tasks, the, uh, the number tends to be higher. So in a nutshell, that is really what I call intelligent safety. It's not about doing observations or, you know, hop or high reliability organizations. Those are not new ideas. They're just a new term for an old idea. And for the last, uh, I don't know, 30 years, we haven't seen a real advance in, in health and safety. The injury rates you know, and certainly the, the fatality rates have remained fairly static. And the reason for that is because the traditional methods have reached the limit of their effectiveness. So now we start to see, you know, in the last few years, large, you know, organizations like the ASSP or the National Safety Council saying, we need a new paradigm. We need something new because, you know, the traditional health and safety approaches are not being effective enough and as I found in my master's thesis, uh, fatalities in high-risk organizations, the actual fatality rate is static or rising, which uh, should be disturbing for everyone because we've done such a great job over the last hundred years bringing that down. So intelligent safety is more about the design of your safety system. Is that accurate or? Well, I think it's about reaching behind the training and the manuals and all that other bureaucratic stuff that we tend to have to say, to, to really ask yourself, is this working? Is it being effective? Because no one asks that. And it's up to the health and safety professional to say, what do I expect to see here? Why am I not seeing it? Because the default often is, well, the worker's not following the procedure or the workers aren't very bright. They're plenty bright. They're trained. They're professionals in, in most cases. But, you know, is that system serving the needs of the company? Or did we just write some procedures and hope for the best? There is no follow-up. There is no going around to the back end and saying, here's the procedure or here's our standard. We expect this output, but nobody ever checks for that expected output. They, everyone just assumes that it's working because we didn't have an incident. So intelligence safety is about examining those especially high-risk tasks and saying, are we doing those safely? Because usually the way you find out you're not is there's a serious incident. Okay. Well, thank you for satisfying my curiosity on that. I'm I'm ready to dive into the book now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is what this is mostly about. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, so the title is Effective Safety Committees, A Practical Guide. So this is less of sort of a philosophical tome on the nature of committees, and it's more of a, a roadmap on how to do them right. That said, why did you t decide to write this book? Like, what, where were you seeing the need? Um, well, Alberta, where I live, and legislated safety committees, you know, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, a lot of people don't realize that Alberta was the first province to legislate safety committees and also the very first province to unlegislate safety committees. Uh, because employers see them as a, you know, a, a, a real I guess, difficult issue to resolve uh, and uh, time consuming and resource consuming. And uh, as as happens in these things and, and in every province in Canada, certainly uh, the regulator puts out a booklet and says, this is why you have to have a safety committee and these are the things the safety committee should do. And, and that that's all well and good. And, and, and they all do that. But uh, I guess part of my frustration and my experience in, in working with larger organizations is that that's where it stops. People go on this uh, legislated course and, and basically it tells them, you know, this is what the law says. This is why you have to have a committee. No one ever says this is how to make it work. And I've had some very positive experiences in, in larger organizations organizing a committee structure and having very engaged committees uh, in one place that I worked, uh, there was a waiting list to get on one of the committees because people saw them as being effective at doing things and really moving the needle and, and thought that their you know, uh, input was being respected and integrated into the organization's actions. In other cases, of course, you know, when you say safety committee, uh, I, I don't know about you, but that conjures up for me, you know, an image of some people sitting in a room, drinking coffee, eating donuts, and complaining about things. Uh, <laughs> I, 
It shouldn't be that way, and it doesn't have to be that way. But I think com- safety committees are misunderstood. Uh, you know, th- the concept has been around since the 1970s, and you know, the intent was to have a forum for workers to work cooperatively with the employer to make sure the workplace remains safe. And I don't think that employers have really seen the value in that. And I really think that health and safety professionals or health and safety departments sometimes miss the value that a safety committee can bring to the effort. So I thought someone should write a book. And I did. I wrote a book about, you know, what, how to have an effective safety committee because it's no use writing a book about why you need one because, you know, the law is there, the regulators telling you why you need one. And uh, so often employers just say, well, you know, we're supposed to have these people. They're supposed to meet once a quarter. Just get some people together and have a meeting and, and talk about safety. And that's about all the direction they get. And then the employer is disappointed when the committee doesn't seem to accomplish anything. And no great secret, neither are the people on the committee. They are, uh, they're there by and large because they want to accomplish something. But, uh, you know, they're, they're not given the training or the tools you know, or the support to be successful. I'm not familiar with like legislation around the globe. I know that a lot of our listeners are in different dur- jurisdictions that we have a lot in Australia and in the States. So I'm not sure if safety committees are, you know, legislated across the board, but are there ideal conditions for a safety committee or, or conversely, red flags for conditions when a safety committee is kind of the raw solution? Well, uh, in in most of the G8 countries, uh, safety committees are uh, a requirement. And even if they're not a requirement, they they are a good idea. It's a great way to engage the frontline work. But red flags for me for a safety committee, you know, it kind of goes like this. Somebody goes to, you know, a senior leader in the company says, hey, we have to have a safety committee. And they say, well, that sounds like a safety department thing, or that sounds like a safety thing. Hey, you safety manager, uh, you safety advisor, you take care of that. And so the safety person or a, a safety advisor ends up chairing the committee and gathering people together and talking about what they want to talk about. So that's a recipe for a very ineffective safety committee. And I say that because uh, the safety advisor or the safety manager tends to have way more knowledge and background in health and safety than anyone on the committee. So inadvertently, they dominate the conversation, they dominate the agenda. And one of the things a safety committee is for is to monitor the employer's health and safety program. So if a safety person's running it, that means they're monitoring their own work, which is sort of a conflict in my book. And that's not a recipe for for good governance. It's not a recipe for good outcomes. Uh, So on on the other side, and and I talk about this in my book, what is the committee for? And I think the employer needs to answer that question before they do anything. What is this for? What do we expect to get? You know, you don't want to invest time and effort in something without understanding what the outcome looks like. And so most employers will say, well, we want to have a safe workplace. And and so the safety committee can help us do that. Yeah, okay, that's all right. But it's really about engaging people who are doing the work in keeping the workplace safe. So if you have a company and a lot of the people who work there are deployed out into the field on jobs, let's say, uh, sometimes what happens is the people on the committee, they're people who tend to be available for meetings during the day. That's not the people out doing the work. So you end up with a committee full of people who are in administrative roles, which are low risk. That that doesn't work so well. So if the company says, we really see a need for a committee, we want to have one, what should it look like? Well, the safety committee is really a feedback mechanism for senior management. It really... At at its base, that's what it does. So you have a health and safety department that deals with all levels of the organization and gives feedback to senior management. And that is exactly what a safety committee is for. So now you've got two feedback loops, which means that the information 
if it's the same, probably is more reliable when it gets to senior management because often senior management has difficulty ensuring that the health and safety program or system is working in the manner that they would expect. And you see examples of this where CEOs, uh, we had a case here in uh, Alberta where the CEO of Suncor Energy, a rather large company, ended up resigning over the company's poor safety performance after being assured that everything was fine. And then there was a string of fatalities. Uh, not because I think Suncor Energy is a bad company or anything, but the information making it to senior management obviously wasn't accurate. So safety committees can give that necessary feedback loop and they can engage at all levels. So you have worker members, you're required to have at least half worker members, and you select the people who are engaged in high risk tasks. And then you have management personnel in a larger company. You may have a whole bunch of workplace committees that feed into a you know, a regional or an area committee. And if you have a very large organization, you might have a, a policy or governance health and safety committee above them. So the health and safety committee is supposed to monitor the employer's health and safety system to make sure it's being effective and try and solve issues or gaps in that, that system with the cooperation of the employer. What a great way to engage people at the front line and get their feedback. And when, you know, we can't come up with a solution, be able to elevate those issues to senior management. What a great mechanism. And so that's the intent of a safety committee, uh, which mirrors the purpose and the intent of a health and safety department or a health and safety uh, you know, arm within the company because it's outside the normal reporting structure or outside the line management structure and provides necessary feedback to each level within the company. So I, I think you've pretty well answered my question as to what defines an effective safety committee. I'm curious about, there are different ways to measure effectiveness. So how would you, how would you measure the success given, given what you just said, the success or the failure of a safety committee? Well, often committees, uh, you know, they need something to sink their teeth into. They need something to strive towards. And I always say the first question you would ask, you know, if someone says, I think I have an effective committee, I always ask, what's their project? What's their project this year? What is their focus? And committees often don't have one, but you need a central theme or project to, to really get people looking in the same direction and working together. So, you know, if you know, you want to measure committee effectiveness. It's not the number of meetings they've had or how long or short those meetings were. You know, are they getting real issues from the workers? Are people comfortable in coming to the committee and bringing forward an issue? And does the committee work to resolve that and get back to that person and say, here is what we ended up with? Because sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes things come to the health and safety committee, they get discussed, you know, they get evaluated, and the decision is, we're okay. I don't think we need to do anything with this, or we're going to defer this uh, until later because we've got a lot on our plate. Those are perfectly good answers, but often people bring forward a concern to the health and safety committee if they know how to do that, because that's usually not that well communicated. And that's the last they hear. So why would they want to participate? You know, instead, if it's an effective committee, they get invited to come to the committee. The person who they talk to has done the research, so they are able to present some possible solutions, and this person gets to be heard by the committee. Why not get it from the horse's mouth? So measuring committee effectiveness is is rather difficult, uh, I would say, unless there's some kind of an accountability framework in place. What's the project? Did you do the meetings? Did you resolve issues? Are you engaging with the workforce? And that is one of the key things. Committees have to engage with workforces, posting the minutes on the wall, putting the minutes on a server drive is not good enough. I, I advocate for committees to provide a quarterly update because most committees meet at least quarterly to the workforce to say, hey, we had a meeting 
Here's the big three items that we talked about. Here's the status on these items. This is what we're working for to try and resolve because these are the issues that, that are important to employees. So who measures the committees? That, you know, that's another issue. You know, is it going to be the health and safety department that gets a report from the committee every year? Is it going to be someone else, operations perhaps, or human resources that says, you know, we need a report on your activities. We want to make sure that you're doing the right things to be effective. You know, if you found a problem, did you review incidents? Did you make recommendations? Were those followed up on? So there's a lot of things you could measure a safety committee on. And the last thing I think you really, really want to measure is how many meetings they have, because that has no relation to how effective they are. Do they have membership that reflects the requirements? And do those members show up for the meetings? That's probably very important because you see meeting minutes that really don't tell you who chaired the meeting. They don't tell you who wasn't present. Or on, uh, in some unfortunate cases, you see that there's the same people are not present all the time. And so the, the committee really has to have some accountability to be able to do something with members who are not meeting uh, their duties as a member of the committee. I wanted to ask as well, you touched on this. Sorry, I know that's a long answer. Oh, no, no, no. That's a, <laughs> it's all good because you you bring in a lot of different threads. And so that's that's what makes it interesting. Um but one thing that you had mentioned was the role of the safety professional in in, a, in terms of what it should not be. So how would you describe the ideal or the best, most effective role for the safety professional in relation to the committee? Well, I've always said that uh, health and safety professionals should be an ex-official member of the committee. And what that means is they, they go to the meetings, but they, they, they don't have a vote. They, they don't they don't have a, a role in the consensus. They're just there as a resource. Uh, so when I was running health and safety departments, I would assign you know a health and safety advisor to each committee to as a resource. And uh, you know it's 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 difficult sometimes for someone who has you know all this knowledge or education or training not to to take over. But uh, it is important that they let the committee do their work and make their decisions and just provide them with information. Uh, you know, so the health and safety professional is often the one that provides them with copies of incident investigations or copies of inspections or copies of procedures because sometimes the committee's project for the year may be to review and update a procedure like uh, confined space entry or fall protection or some area where the committee might have some expertise or maybe they would need some training in that area. So the committee has a lot of things to monitor if the employer's doing any uh, industrial hygiene monitoring or testing. The committee may wish to review that, but they may need some training or, you know, because having someone in the room that fully understands that has all that knowledge doesn't mean that the members of the committee will ask the questions they want to ask. So it's often, you know, nice to provide them with a primer and say, well, this is how exposure limits work. So this is what these numbers mean. This is how we measure them so that they understand what they're looking at. Uh, in, in terms of incident investigations, you know, they get sent to the committee. That happens in a lot of companies, but the people on the committee don't necessarily have any training. They don't understand what they're looking at and they just say, well, hey, that looks okay to me. Uh, so by providing training to the committee, the employer demonstrates that they value the work the committee's doing. They value those employees and they value that feedback. Yeah. I mean, they're really setting up the members to give more useful feedback if they're training them, which um, I was going to ask you about. So thank you for, for going into that. I'd like to talk about terms of reference. And the well, reason is that, oh, sorry. Could I just add something? Sorry. Uh, you know. Yeah. Of course. In terms of, uh, you know, the health and safety person's, you know, role, the professional's role with the health and safety committee, I, one of the most valuable things I've found with health and safety committees is as a sounding board. If, you know, because health and safety systems tend to be in a bit of a state of flux, in a state of change. And if there are changes that are coming about, it is really good to get in a room with a bunch of, you know, people who are actually doing the work and say, hey, 
what do you think about this? We need to know. We want your feedback before we, you know, really finalize a draft on this training program or this new process. And and that's really, really valuable because, you know, we see so many times changes fail because they're not socialized enough because the organization isn't prepared for them or maybe there's too much change. So that's a really valuable thing that the health and safety professional can get from a safety committee. Yeah, and and, uh, people are much more likely to adopt changes that they've been had a hand in, at at least had some feedback. They didn't design them, but okay. So I'd like to ask about terms of reference because they're mentioned quite a lot in in the book. They're a big part of you know almost almost everything was like here's an issue. Well, that should have been put in the terms of reference. So <laughs> I'll just open that up and say, uh, what, how do you, do, what are they and how do they relate to committee effectiveness? Sure. Well, the, the terms of reference, depending on where you are, you know, sometimes in legislation, it says you have to cover these things, but really the terms of reference for any committee, not just a health and safety committee is really the handbook or the manual by which the committee operates. And the, why is that important? Well, when someone comes on to a committee, it's they should be able to read the terms of reference and understand how the committee works and what it's for, what it does. You know, when you're recruiting people for a safety committee, you know, you have your little elevator speech or your pitch. But when they come on to the safety committee, they should be able to read the terms of reference and say, okay, well, how does the committee go about reviewing incidents or how does the committee do inspections or how are meetings organized? And you know, how are the co-chairs established? How long am I on this committee? That's often the first question I might have. How long do I have to do this for? You know, and, and when, when people get appointed to a committee, in a lot of cases, the terms of reference will say, well, we need a member from this area or from this discipline. And so, you know, we are getting the right mix of people in the room. So the the terms of reference is very, very important. I talked earlier about an accountability system. Well, the the committee has to be accountable to that terms of reference. Are you doing what you're meant to do? And the terms of reference doesn't just have to be a bare bones document that meets some legislated requirement because the terms of reference is also the employer's opportunity to say, this is what we expect from you, a health and safety committee. And this is what we expect from the members uh, because, you know, it's it, some things are intuitive. You say, well, who's going to take the minutes for the health and safety committee? Does it have to have a secretary? Well, usually no. Usually the management co-chair has some administrative resources that they can assign to do the administrative side of the health and safety committee. But in some cases, you know, uh, I've seen committees where the co-chair that's not chairing their meeting is doing the minutes, and it's very difficult to participate in a meeting when you're trying to do the minutes, you know, as the meeting is going on. So uh, it is uh, it is such an important document. We wouldn't, you know, ask somebody to, oh, I don't know, conduct an excavation or to climb a tower without having assess the risk and have a procedure for that. So it's not really fair to say to someone, you should be on the health and safety committee. And all we know is that you get free glazed donuts. Let's talk about, I'd like to pull out, you've got more than more than these, but I'd like to pull out some of the pitfalls that you've seen in committees and, and just sort of talk about what they are and how to prevent them, I suppose. So the first one is poor communication with the workforce. Yeah, that's that's a huge one. I, you know, um, I, I, I work with a lot of companies and so sometimes, you know, I'll say to somebody, uh, so do you guys have a health and safety committee? And they'll say, what's that? So I explain what that is and they're like, no, I don't think so. And then later I find out they're on the committee. That's a true story. But anyway, uh, but people don't often don't know there's a committee. They don't know what it's for. They don't know what it's doing. They don't know who's on it, you know? And, and I mean, if you say, well, look, it's posted on the wall. There's a list of people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, when, when a committee's purpose, you know, and really the purpose is, you know, to, to have frontline workers talking with the employer about resolving health and safety issues, keeping the workplace safe, it's probably important that the people they represent know who they are, know what they're doing. And so, you know, 
how does that happen? You know, and and I think uh, you know, as as part of the terms of reference, you know, I'll, I, I kind of lean on that a lot, as you say. But uh, you know, you we should be defining how does the committee communicate with the workforce? Is it going to a quarterly meeting or a monthly meeting and saying, "Hey, we just had a meeting," so it's up to the the co chair to say, "Hey, when you go out there, here's the things you need to tell people about." This is what's going on. This is what we're working on. And solicit people, hey, you know, if you have an issue, we're here to listen. So, you know, why is it that a workforce or most of a workforce wouldn't even be aware they have a committee? Well, that's ineffective communication. If people knew there was a committee and they perceived it as doing something and uh, perceived it as a good forum to get results, then they'd be much more engaged in that process. So communication is very, very important. And, and you know, the, the legislative requirements are often something like you must post or make available the minutes to the workforce. Well, that's not good enough. You know, I, I, in my view, health and safety committees do important work and they should be informing the people they represent of the work that they're doing or what it is they're attempting to accomplish. If, you know, if it's, it's the same old uh, thing you say in business, you know, you might have the best product in the world. But if you're not marketing it, no one will buy it. <laughs> so you have to advertise. You have to communicate. It is so critical that, you know, and, and, it's, and it's really great when you talk to somebody, you know, you're in a workplace and you say, hey, do you have a safety committee? And they say, yes, so-and-so is my representative. Great. Oh, boy, that's, that, that's good news. And, uh, and if you're very, very fortunate, they'll say, hey, and they're working on this issue right now to get it resolved. So it's not hard to determine whether or not your committee is communicating effectively. I'm going to take a little side detour because you're talking about communication. One thing I was curious about, you've mentioned, and certainly this would be the case in really large companies. In some cases, you have it's not just a safety committee. You've got subcommittees, you've got councils, you've got, it can be a complex organizational structure. And communication is really important. So what is the best way or what are some good ways for complex structures to communicate well and work together effectively? Uh, it depends on the organization, to be truthful. I think that uh, workplace committees representing specific workplaces must communicate with that workplace for sure. But in large organizations, for, for instance, you may have a division that has six safety committees. So it might be uh, wise to, to have what uh, an aggregator, a regional or a divisional safety committee that sort of aggregates the activities, the concerns, and takes care of things that get elevated from the workplace committees because workplace committees can't necessarily solve all the issues. Uh, but if they do solve an issue, it's nice to tell someone you know, in the division because that might not be a unique issue. And, uh, you know, but... You know, if they if they learn something and they're able to solve this issue, that's great. If they're not able to solve an issue, they can still escalate that. So you can have a sort of a, a, a regional committee or a division committee that's a, an aggregator. And that committee may communicate with senior management. And so you establish that link and that communications link. Or in a larger organization, you may have five divisional committees that each have four to six workplace committees under them that, you know, really run into a, a health and safety uh, council or a health and safety policy committee or something like that, which would primarily be, you know, staffed by senior management, but even at each level. So the divisional committee would pull members from the workplace committees, usually the co-chair, the worker co-chair. And the council would pull people from, you know, these divisional committees into the council. But because you have to keep these committees, you know, fairly small, like around a dozen people, you don't want them to get to run away with you. And that committee at the corporate level would be the one that deals with policy issues, would be the one that deals with organizational issues. And in some cases, that would be the committee that would communicate with the board of directors on health and safety. Sometimes a board of directors has a, a health and safety committee, 
or they have a human resources governance committee or something like that. So it th- in that way, you can establish an aggregator to really bring the issues and the salient information to each level of management. So the divisional level, obviously, you would be dealing mostly with middle management. But at the corporate level, at the policy committee level, you'd be dealing with directly with senior management. So a workplace committee might meet once a month. A divisional committee might meet once a quarter. And the corporate or a policy committee might meet twice a year. Uh, so that allows for communication, but timely communication. And it also allows for, you know, really getting the salient information because, you know, senior managers in an organization with 10,000 employees really aren't concerned with whether or not somebody did every single monthly inspection at facility X. They just want to know that we completed, you know, 99% of our inspections and, you know, we didn't find anything particularly dangerous. Yeah. At different levels, different people need to know different things. That's not a, how well, eloquent. People have different focuses. At different levels of the organization, the focuses exactly. are different. Exactly. And so at the workplace level, you know, it's, is are there hazards? Is it safe? At the, you know, middle management level, it is, are we providing the, the appropriate resources to facilitate a safe workplace? The senior management is, is the health and safety system working? Is it doing what it's supposed to? Are we on top of the risk profile? Yeah. I'm going to go back and, and mention another uh, pitfall that you had pulled out, and that was the committee is overwhelmed. So other than the committee saying, hey, we're overwhelmed, are there any, what are the other signs of this? At what point is a committee just working hard and doing great stuff? And at, at what point are we maybe giving them too much? Well, it often isn't the committee being given too much. It's often the committee taking on too much. And then, and you know, when a committee's overwhelmed, you know, you tend to find uh, one of the co-chairs is, you know, uh, has a, a messiah complex and they're crusading for, uh, you know, I don't know what. But, and so uh, this, the terms of reference is so important to keep the committee focused. And so committees can get into a, you know, uh, we're going to do everything. We're going to be everything to everyone. And one of the ways that committees get overwhelmed is in a unionized environment, you get shop stewards on the committee, which sounds like a good idea, but they like to talk about labor relations issues, not health and safety issues. And and sometimes if you get people, you know, from human resources on the committee, again, they want to talk about things that are important to them. So, you know, the committee can easily get overwhelmed because let's face it, you know, most committees you're going to meet, I don't know, 10 times a year for an hour. So that's 10 whole hours in a year. Sure, there's a bit of pre-work and everything. So let's say there's 30 hours in a year that you're going to spend on this committee doing some kind of committee activities. That really isn't a lot of time, you know, and that's why the committee needs support from the employer. Because the committee can't run around and do all these things. I mean, if the committee says, hey, we've got a couple of solutions here. We need to get those costed out. Does that mean someone from the committee's got to make all these phone calls and pull together these quotes? Uh, I mean, that's certainly something that the health and safety committee could do or some other part of the organization procurement could do because the com- committee members' time is valuable. And so committees get overwhelmed by trying to do too much, but they also get overwhelmed by not having well-organized meetings. And what I mean by that is there's an agenda that comes out that says, we're going to have a meeting. It's going to be at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, and we're going to talk about safety stuff. Boy, um, you know, the co-chair has an important role in putting out a clear agenda And of course, at the beginning of the meeting saying, this is the agenda. Does anyone have anything to add? Because we're going to decide right now if we're going to talk about that this time. So co-chairs have to structure the meetings so that they are going to last about an hour because people's time is valuable. And, And to appreciate that time and show that that time is valuable and make sure the meeting is properly organized because I... I've been to health and safety committee meetings that lasted four hours and they accomplished not much. So it's easy for a committee to get overwhelmed, but it's 
it's important that committees understand that they can pick and choose what information they want, what what issues that they're going to address, because not every issue is 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 the end of the world. Not every issue is high risk. Not every issue really bears the committee's full attention. In some cases, committees can just hand off an issue to the health and safety department, to a manager, and it'll be resolved. So it's easy for committees to get overwhelmed. And I mean, I really can't stress that enough because if you have an engaged committee, they want to do a lot of things, but keeping them focused is so important. That's why I talked earlier about does the committee have a project because that helps keep the committee focused on the work it's supposed to be doing, not on the work they would like to be doing. You know, it's about wants and needs. The committee wants certain things. They need certain things, but really they're required to do a fairly narrow scope of things. Well, and you talked about training as well. So that occurs to me that, you know, facilitation is a skill. Keeping things moving at a clip, making sure no one person is dominating the conversation, that there's not sort of this scope creep (laughs) in terms of topics. So that might be a good uh, place for training as well. Absolutely. I I think, you know, we we kind of miss that, you know, it's not so bad if you're you're a manager and they say, hey, you're going to chair this committee, plan the meeting, do what you need to do, no problem. But what if you're a truck driver or a welder? That's intimidating. And if there isn't sufficient guidance or even some training to assist you in chairing a meeting, you know, it's it's not a monkey see, monkey do sort of thing. You really do have to think about that. And it is, in some cases, quite demanding to keep control of a meeting. But uh, as I alluded to earlier, you know, people take this mandated legislative training. It doesn't cover things like that. So a lot of the discussion is about setting up a safety committee. But I would think that in many cases, safety professionals are inheriting existing committees and those existing committees may not be at all effective. So what is your advice, like where to start for someone who has inherited what they can plainly see is an ineffective committee? Should they revitalize it? Should they stop it and then well, rebuild it later? Or I think that, uh, you know, uh, health and safety professionals, unfortunately, I often walk into these situations where, you know, you have a dysfunctional health and safety committee or committees. You need to go and sit in a meeting and not say anything unless someone asks you to, but, and, and try and understand the dynamic in the meeting. In some cases, the, the chair of the meeting just completely steamrollers everyone, doesn't get any input, and they have their, their agenda, and that's all that's important. So you need to understand the dynamic. And I, you know, going back to basics, and, and you know, you can ask people on the committee, what, what's the committee for? What does it do? And you'll often get very, very different answers from people. And of course, the all important question is, what would you like it to be? Uh, What would you like it to do? Because, you know, people do have expectations when their time is being taken up. And, uh, you know, some people are just waiting to get off the committee. You know, I'm getting replaced in six months. That's all I know. But understanding the dynamic and really understanding what people think the committee's purpose is. And, And often I can tell you that companies and employers don't really have a good idea of what the health and safety committee is supposed to be doing. So they have no idea why it's not effective. Uh, And small wonder the people on the committee, since the employer has no idea what they're supposed to be doing and has no expectations, it's pretty hard for you to be effective because there's no accountability structure and no one's really sure what it is really you're supposed to be doing. So the, the place that you could really start once you understand what, what is happening, how this came to be, isn't to revamp the committee really and, and write new rules and everything, but is, is, you know, the health and safety professional would work with the employer and say, look, you've got all these people, you know, you've got a hundred people that are going to all these meetings. What do you expect from that? Do you want some kind of output? Do you think they should be doing something constructive? That's the place to start. You know, you can't blame people for being ineffective when they haven't been given any clear direction. I'm going to mention a couple pitfalls that you mentioned in the book as well for um, when a committee is sort of already ineffective, some different ways. 
And maybe you have some advice for listeners who have seen this. So one of them is a committee has difficulty reaching consensus. Yeah. (laughs) You know, committees, not just health and safety committees, but any committee normally runs by consensus. You know, uh, do we generally agree? That means that people may disagree, but, you know, as the chair, you would say, well, we've addressed those concerns, or at least we think we've addressed those concerns adequately. You know, do we generally agree? And, you know, there's often people who are argumented on health and safety committees. Uh, You know, they have very strong views, and that's often a function of them not getting the information. Uh, I'm sure we've all been to meetings where somebody says, look at this. I need you to make a decision on this, yes or no. And you're like, well, this is a 30-page document that doesn't tell me anything. I need more information. So committees often end up being, and, and I see this happen where the chair takes a vote, which is really a good way to divide people and make people unhappy uh, instead of a more respectful approach and saying, does anyone have any comments on what's being discussed? And it's okay if the committee can't reach a consensus at, at a meeting and needs to defer, but consistent deferrals and, you know, vacillating, that's, that's always very bad. That really harms the committee's effectiveness. And and that really goes back to training and and making sure that people understand how the committee works. It is not a popularity contest. You do not vote on things. People get their say and have their concerns addressed. And generally, you know, does everyone agree? And and normally, I I call it polling. You know, when something's been discussed, you go around the table and say, do you have anything to add? Uh, do you feel your concerns have been addressed or, you know, and maybe not resolved, but just addressed? And that's a good way to get consensus because some people will say, I mean, I've been in that position myself on, on boards and committees. You know, I understand, but I don't agree. <laughs> and we're moving on because I got a chance to voice my dissent. Uh, but, uh, you know, most most of the uh, board or committee said, oh, yeah, well, we think this is OK. Fair enough. So. You know, people come into the committee and they seem to think sometimes that everyone has to agree. Not true. There's always going to be people that disagree. And frankly, that's healthy. That's what you want. You want people who don't don't agree. There's no need to get into a fight about it. You just acknowledge that they have concerns. And maybe later they might get to say, I told you this wouldn't work. But, <laughs> you know, the committee must move on with its business. So, you know, a lot of times committees get deadlocked on issues and they're like, no, where, you know, half of the committee says this, half of the committee says that. If you're in a larger organization, that's a good opportunity to escalate something and say, look, we can't agree on the right path here. Maybe this goes to the divisional committee. We need a decision from them. Or the committee can make a recommendation to the employer and say, you know, we're not sure what to do here, but here's some options. And uh, let the employer make the decision. But if a committee can't reach consensus, that, that kind of means there's some infighting. And frankly, that eats up a tremendous amount of time and energy when really, you know, it's not necessary for everyone to agree. And I think it's very important for the co-chairs in particular to understand the whole concept of consensus rather than trying to get everyone to agree to everything because, you know, most committees have 10 or 12 members and you're never going to get 12 people to agree on anything other than the meeting should be over now. I was going to say that that's maybe also a good rule for terms of reference. Like, you know, if we reach a deadlock or whatever, these these are the options we can take or this is how we typically handle this sort of thing. And, and lots of terms of reference would have something in there to resolve those kinds of issues. You know, uh, some kind of a resolution process uh, That's required in some places, but it is a good idea, as you say. Well, I'm going to move on to some questions that I ask all my guests. Um, And (laughs) this one is about training tomorrow's safety professionals, which you know a little bit about having done so. If you could only focus, if you could only teach soft skill training, which is to say human relationship type skills, as opposed to technical skills, what do you think the most important of those skills 
uh, would be for future safety professionals to master or, you know, work on? I think one of the most important skills is how to have the difficult conversation. Health and safety professionals are often not delivering good news. Uh, you know, this is not in compliance. We had an incident. You know, this is this isn't working right. And um, you know, you really have to be able to develop the skills to have that difficult conversation. We see somebody doing something that is risky or downright unsafe. Calling them a name might feel good, but that certainly isn't the way to go. I, you know, one of my favorite, you know, opening phrases is, "Can you help me understand why you're doing that, or why you're do why you're doing that that way?" I'm not sure I understand why it is you do the job in this manner, uh, because you're not the expert. You're never the expert, and you need to understand you're never the expert in that conversation. The person you're talking to is the expert. And you're trying to get information and cooperation. So the way to get information and cooperation is to be respectful, to be curious. It is not to be judgmental or tell them they're breaking some kind of law. Uh, that's not where the conversation should start or end. And so having those difficult conversations, but being respectful. You know, when you show up and there's been an incident, your first question should not be, who is the idiot who did this or what the heck happened here? Your first question should be, is everyone all right? How can I help? Uh, safety professionals sometimes look upon themselves as some kind of an enforcement person or a compliance person or, you know, this. We, we all, we've all heard the safety cop, but being able to relate to people and, and have those hard conversations where you're basically telling someone I don't think you're doing your job correctly. I don't think this is safe. But you can't say that because they think they're doing the right thing. So you you have to be able to engage that person and say, look, I'm not an expert here, but can you explain to me why it is you're doing that in that manner? I think health and safety professionals have built a reputation for themselves over the, I don't know, the past 20 or 30 years that I've been in health and safety as People who are far too judgmental and, and, you know, they need to be more inquisitive and respectful. That would be an excellent start. Yeah. And I mean, difficult conversations are, are difficult for a reason. And so it, you know, it, it's a good idea to learn how to deal with them. If you could go back in time to the beginning of your safety career, and I know you had a lot of military years, they may have overlapped with safety, but the beginning of your safety career, What's one piece of advice that you might give to yourself? I think that, uh, well, it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, I think uh, don't be afraid to take credit for successes, but I would temper that with saying, don't dare you dare take credit for safety performance successes because that's not you. That's the organization. That's the people in operations. But if you have a success, you know, you, you redo a training program and you put in place an initiative, don't be afraid to take credit, but don't take credit for the organization's success and certainly don't take credit for some giveaway of hats and jackets like that makes things safer. And I, I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, um, work on the relationships. You know, I, I tell you a bit of a story about that. I was part of a very high powered safety team in a large organization. And, um, uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, I think five managers. And uh, at the time, the CEO was very, very concerned about the company, where the company was in terms of health and safety, and it needed to improve. And we did some fantastic work to bring the company along. But in some cases, what happened was certain areas started saying, we're perfect. We've got perfect score uh, on all of our safety metrics. We're doing all the stuff. Everything's great. You know, and there was sort of a zero tolerance approach for any kind of infractions or deviations. Uh, in my area, we always had a lower score than the other areas. And then, uh, you know, with my management team, I said, you know, this is honest. We, we know where the problems are. We're working on it. We need to solve the problems. We need to understand where we are and solve the problems. And that was our focus. 
No one was running around saying, you know, someone deviated, it's terrible, it's the end of the world, safety trumps all. And uh, of course, as with all things, you know, the wheel turned and safety became less important as our safety performance improved. And so there came a time when they felt that, you know, we had accomplished the critical or, or the crucial turnaround of the company. And now we needed less horsepower in the health and safety department. And all of those other managers got laid off and I remained because I took a different approach. Don't think you're the smartest person in the room and don't think you're always right. There's always someone in the room that's smarter than you are. And there's always someone in the room that probably thinks you're wrong and they might be right. I've had a lot of guests point out that, you know, a, a lack of incidents it could just mean a whole lot of near misses that no one is comfortable is speaking up about, right? So better to know what's what's going, what where improvements are needed than to have no information, really. Absolutely. No, I, I, okay. Absolutely. So how could our listeners learn more about some of the things we talked about today? Obviously, there's the book, but do you have, uh, are there any websites or concepts or places that you think have been maybe really helpful to you in your own journey? Um, you know, I, I wish I could say there are. I, that's why I wrote a book because, you know, it was really difficult to find uh, good material. And, uh, you know, that's why there's not really any references uh, to other publications in my book. It tends to be an overlooked area when it comes to health and safety committees. But I do, or at least I do try uh, to keep my website up to date in terms of all the blogs that I write. You know, and I do write blogs on topics related to safety committees. A lot of people will go to, you know, whoever their regulator is and say, hey, what do you have, uh, you know, to, to help me, you know, look at my safety committee or improve my safety committee? And sometimes those are good resources and sometimes they're, they're not very good. I think that, uh, you know, in terms of looking at safety committees and improving safety committees, you have to understand the dynamic, understand what the organization wants, and try and assist those people in feeling valued. It's not as important as what it is that, you know, these little things the committee does or has to do. It's about making people feel like they're doing something that is important and that their contribution is valued. No one wants to be part of a committee where no one cares about what they do and they can't accomplish anything. Well, you mentioned... Um your website, where can our listeners, and we'll have this in the show, show notes as well, but where can our listeners find you on the web? That's a, Is LinkedIn also a good place? or That's a rarebit.ca. That's connected to my LinkedIn profile, of course. And, uh, you know, with a last name like Rabbit, I am not hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about that with a last name like Conquest. Well, I'm afraid our time is up. I'd like to thank our listeners for tuning in. And thanks so much for chatting with me today, Dave. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Mary. As always, I'd like to give my thanks to the Safety Labs by Slice team. Best committee ever. Bye for now. Safety Labs is created by Slice, the only safety knife on the market with a finger-friendly blade. Find us at sliceproducts.com. Until next time, Stay safe.